So we actually, we are using a lot of computer methods that are sort of similar to what Google is doing when they are um, ranking all the documents on, on, on the interweb, we are, uh, on the internet. Uh, for example, a disease description from a database like, like, like this, breast cancer here, I mean, how similar is it to, uh, to other diseases? I mean, how similar is breast cancer to schizophrenia, for example? What is the likelihood that two diseases actually share a, um, a, um, a, a gene? One of the discoveries from the Human Genome Project was that our organism is extremely gene poor. I mean, uh, we have around um, 25,000 genes in our genome, protein coding genes. And this was a big disappointment for mankind, I would say, because uh, before the human genome, there was a couple of other organisms that had been sequenced, for example, a small worm called C. elegans, sort of one millimeter long and likes to live in the soil and eat potatoes and irritate the farmers and so on. It has around 1,000 cells, this worm. And when the genome of that worm was sequenced, 19,000 genes were found. It actually has 300 nerve cells, so it needs to drive that simple uh, uh, sort of brain-like system it has and, and, and so on. And for that you need a lot of genes to drive the biochemistry behind sort of running nerve cells and brain-like functionality. So we only have a few thousand more genes than, than a ridiculous worm of, of uh, one millimeter in, in, in length. I mean, it's a big disappointment and I mean, many of these genome researchers are almost crying that how could the human genome be so gene poor? And we still don't know the full answer to, to that. But what I would like to, to mention here is that for sure many of the genes we have are doing more than one thing. When we are not having an alcoholism gene or a hair loss gene and, and, and a homosexuality gene and so on, I mean many of the genes are doing many things and, and, and uh, they have impact on more than one disease and many of the disease correlations we see, they, um, they have presumably um, um, their origin in the fact that one gene is, is playing a role in more than one disease. So we use these text mining methods on, 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 on the disease description and we also work with electronic patient records and the text that will describe your, 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 your disease. And I'll talk a little bit about that. And Denmark is actually a good country for doing this kind of research because we have a semi well organized healthcare system and you can actually log into your own patient record and at least some of the data will, can, can be found if you use your NEM ID and then you log in to your patient record and you can see some of the data that the healthcare system and the hospitals have collected um, uh, about you. And the good thing in Denmark, of course, also that we have the social security number, we have the person number that may, makes everything traceable. We can go into the databases and find out all the diseases that, that, that this person was um, hospitalized for. So we have a lot of data in, Den in Denmark that describes the phenotype side of things. We, and now the genotypes are coming, the DNA sequences. So we, we are really in a good position uh, to make this bridge and bridge the gap between the genotype and, and, and the phenotype. And on top of that, um, we are not that healthy, as I said before. So that's uh, sort of added value. <laughs> In, in, uh, in this whole business. So we have started working on the patient records. And uh, I mean, here you see a so-called Wordle, I'm sure you know them, that sort of uh, illustrates the word statistics that we find in, in, um, in texts. And this is a set of patient records from, from Rich Hospital, uh, and this is testis cancer um, uh, patients. And you see some of the words, I mean, th these are in Danish and so on. Uh, smoker uh, and, and, and so on, uh, various words. But of course, when I switch to some other cohort, and this is a, a, another set from Rich Hospital, 1,000 infertile Danish uh, men, uh, we see um, words like puberty here and uh, 
uh, I mean, testicle and tobacco has an influence on this. And of course, when we switch phenotype, when we switch disease, the sort of word profile in these patient records is also, also changing. I mean, infertility is a big issue in, 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 in Denmark. Uh, as you know, the semen quality is, is going down and there is hardly any risk of being together with the Danish men anymore. <laughs> Uh, and it, it, it's actually, um, you know, better to know that before the cocktails, right? So, uh, um, uh, and it, it's actually not entirely completely uh, funny because we are approaching uh, a situation where one out of ten babies um, uh, is not homemade, but 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 it requires some kind of of, um, of assistance and, and and so on. And of course, this was not the case, like if we go back 50 years, we had an okay semen quality, now it has been reduced. So there's something in the environment that seems to make a lot of impact. It's not the genes which have changed over the last 50 years. So also, this relationship between the environment, the chemical environment we live in, and our genes, and so maybe some of our gene um, profiles have sort of higher susceptibility uh, and, and, and it's easier to disturb our system than in other countries. This is uh, what is, for example, being studied. But I mean, we can get access to these uh, data. Here you see a word from St. Hans, the largest Danish mental uh, hospital, and you see words like schizophrenia, Danish word for headache here, and side effects. I mean, the drugs you get at a, at a, at a mental hospital, they give you a lot of side effects and a and, and, and lot of... Uh, sort of um, migraine and, 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 and a lot of that stuff. So these data, they are also part of this problem of hacking the, the DNA code because the data, the DNA in itself is not that interesting. We need to link it to, 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 the, to the diseases. So how do we actually do that? And I will go a little bit quick uh, over that um, because we, we use text mining methods to, to, um, to understand all these texts that describe the, the diseases, for example, the one you saw before here for breast cancer. I mean, how, how far is it, how, 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 uh, how quantitatively, how far is it from other, other diseases, and, and how do we actually uh, do that? And, and um, it's actually quite a simple um, uh, idea uh, that we also use on the patient records. So therefore, I, I'm showing it before I, I show our work on, 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 on the patient records. So we have a lot of descriptions of diseases here. How do we put them into the same space? What we do is actually to use what we call a controlled medical vocabulary. So we have a lot of words, medical words, thousands of medical words, and we look for these words in the disease descriptions, and then we can sort of get all the disease descriptions, even if they've been made by um, thousands of different doctors and so on. Uh, maybe one disease description had been made by, by 10 different doctors, ad, uh, clinicians adding to it and so on. We can sort of take these very different texts and move them into the same, same space. This is what we use these controlled vocabularies uh, for we, we take a disease and then we take out words from, from the controlled uh, vocabulary. Here you see the words coming out for breast cancer and there's another disease uh, here with other words. And I have a third one here that's schizophrenia and there's a lot, some other words that, 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 that come out here. And um, then we can actually take the words and we can put them in this what we call a medical term space. And then we can have one vector that describe the words for each disease, and then we can just measure the angle between the diseases. And then suddenly we have a system that will quantify the overlap between two diseases. And we can use that to search for genes which are related to a specific disease and, and, and so on. But it looks very complicated here, but we start with some texts, we use some Google-like methods on, on, on the text, and then suddenly we have all these different diseases put into one space, where we can say, okay, the overlap between these two diseases uh, on a scale from zero to one is, is maybe 0.3 or something uh, like that. And we can use that to, to, to assess how likely it is that, that uh, a gene is involved in, in, in more than one disease, for example. So we can sort of make a matrix 
that computes the distances over all the diseases and so on. A lot of technicalities um, that, 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 that can be, be used to quantify this phenotypic overlap between diseases. So it's not all diseases which are devastating, like breast cancer and schizophrenia and so on. Here's a more funny disease from the database. It's, I, I'm not sure that, that, um, that you have all heard about it, but it's quite common, so presumably in here there are some people who suffer from this disease. It's called the Achu syndrome. Okay. The Achu syndrome. So this is a, um, a disease where you sneeze when you are exposed to light. Okay? Uh, I'm sure that it's not that uncommon, so I'm, I'm couldn't you bring on the light and we, <laughs> we could see? And actually, it turns out to be inheritable, uh, this disease, because it runs in family and so on. When, when, you, when you read about a disease like this, you would think, okay, this disease is alone in, in, in disease space. There's no other disease that would look like this crazy disease. But when you go over with our angle measurements over all the diseases, we found another disease called gastric sneezing. Okay, that's when you sneeze when your stomach is full of food. <laughs> and it's also inheritable, it turns out, runs in family. And when we use our angle measurement, the, 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 the phenotypic overlap between these two diseases is 0 0.441. And of course, we have not found out whether there is a common gene behind these two diseases. But I mean, we can compare phenotypes and, and diseases in this kind of way using these Google-like like, uh, like methods. And I don't show much of, of all this gene business here in this talk um, uh, because it's kind of uh, complicated. But I mean, as I said, here's the heart. Um, and uh, there's a lot of heart defects that we, for example, study. And this business that one gene produce one phenotype, I mean, it's history, right? Now we know that there are many genes that contribute to a specific phenotype, and the genes make networks, and they work together, and maybe a mutation in this particular gene over here is compensated for in the genes it interact with, and so on. So, so, um, so um, uh, diseases, uh, there are networks of genes uh, behind, I don't know whether it's, I need to turn down this. So, uh, but I mean, we can use these type of t uh, techniques to find, for example, genes which relate to this heart defect and not the other one, and so on. So we, we can really zoom in on phenotypic differences between diseases using these Google-like methods. And there's a paper here if you, if you like to read more about this kind of, of, uh, kind of idea. And then, of course, when we have found a gene that, re that we think relates to a specific phenotype, then we can go to our collaborators, for example, and uh, some of them have um, embryos from legal abortions in the freezer, and um, then they can go and look for the gene, they can stain the tissue, and then they can confirm, and we've had a lot of luck actually finding disease genes in this uh, way, where we tell our experimental friends, so we are the computer guys, they do the wet experiments and they take the tissue out of the freezer and then they confirm and then they have a lot of more luck when we sort of uh, use the computer to make the pre prediction instead of them uh, looking in a more random, random fashion. So, so back to the patient records because this idea where we, where we compare diseases and, and compute the, the similarity between um, uh, schizophrenia and breast cancer and so on, so that we find the genes that are related to the disease we are looking at can be used also on the text in a patient record. Of course, a patient record is full of measurements of biochemical things and blood pressures and a lot of stuff, but there's also a lot of text that the doctors write about your disease. And uh, I mean, we can get out the word frequencies, but we can use the same kind of, of, of method. We again, ju we just need a controlled vocabulary, a medical vocabulary to bring all the patients into the same space so that we can compare them and compute the, the um, difference between 
uh, Mr. Hansen and, and Mrs. Peterson and so on from the text that we actually find in their patient records. So in this case, we use something that WHO has made. It's called the International Classification of Disease. So um, uh, there is sort of a lot of chapters that describe this different diseases. I mean, chapter six here, diseases of the nervous system, and chapter seven, diseases of the eye and the agnexa and so on. Different um, uh, sort of chapters and a lot of words that describe specific diseases. Here are some heart disease words. So, so again, it's a controlled vocabulary that, that is used in the Danish hospitals, of course. Here you see the English translation, but actually when we go to a Danish um, uh, hospital, you can find the same words used, just translated from the WHO version in English, translated into Danish. There's around 22,000 terms in the vocabulary. And then we sort of, we make a lot of Google tricks and, and text mining efforts. But here you, for example, see schizophrenia up there. It's called F20. And then there's a subtype of schizophrenia called paranoid schizophrenia, F200. So there's a hierarchy in this kind of uh, controlled vocabulary that we use to make sense of all these, these um, uh, patient records. And the good thing about, um, there's a lot of tricks, and I mean, sometimes they use different ending and so on. Um, uh, and and, and, and we, we, we take care of that uh, when we do our text mining. But the good thing is uh, that the same system is used uh, in, in many countries worldwide, right? The same WHO system. And of course, often when we study diseases, we combine a group of, of sick people with a disease from one country uh, with, with another cohort from another country. And, and when the countries are using the same systems, we can combine them, even if we, we, we find it hard to combine, say, Danish text with Japanese. We can, we, we can use the, the controlled vocabulary to actually make the same kind of profiling. Here you see F20, you see clearly this is schizophrenia, <laughs> and here <laughs> paranoid schizophrenia. Um, you get the idea that, that there's some infrastructure here in the healthcare system that we can, can, can use. So when, when we analyze the patient records, it, it's very simple actually. I mean, we're just looking for the words. So this is a part of a patient record from St. Hans in Danish. I apologize for that, but you see schizophrenia here, paranoid schizophrenia here. And we are making a little bit of, of um, screening. I mean, we handle uh, sentences with negations in a special way. Also, when, when, when family is mentioned, we take those sentences out and so on. But it's the same idea. We take a text that is written by many different doctors. We look for these words so that we bring the patient records into the same, same patient space. And we can do the same trick as you saw before. We can simply having, have each patient sort of uh, being represented by, by a vector with all these words. And we get a, a long list of patients. And then we have all these words. And we can say, OK, we have a one here if that word and that disease term is present for that patient and absent for another, and so on. So we get these long vectors, and suddenly we can compute the, the uh, distance between uh, Mr. Hansen and, and, and Mrs. Peterson, and, and, and so on. And we can group the patients and say, OK, you have a lot of diseases in common. You, you are not just having schizophrenia. You have also type 2 diabetes, and you've also had another problem early in your life, and so on. So we can make a much more fine-grained sort of grouping of the patients, and maybe we can hope to match those fine-grained phenotypes with the fine-grained molecular level data that I talked about be, be, before. One problem at the hospitals with patient records is that, that many of these disease codes um, that could have been put in for a patient, they are not being put in for billing reasons and, and, and a lot of reasons that I will not go into. But in this um, uh, example here, you can see that, that, that when we use our Google methods, our text mining methods, we are roughly finding 10 times as many um, uh, words, disease terms, as the doctor, doctors put in by, 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 by um, hand. It's of course not because they didn't put in the disease terms. They just did put it in in the free text. And then we can use the Google methods to actually pick up 
those terms that they wrote in the free text instead of sort of clicking them into the sort of structured fields in the in the in the um, in the patient record. So we can make a much more sort of complete uh, sort of description of each patient in this way by using the text mining and. And we can also go back and see at the different chapters of diseases. I mean, the colors here are hard to see, but uh, I mean, we pick up a lot of new words. These are, are the data from, the, from, from St. Hans, where we analyzed around 8,000 patient records from, from, um, uh, from St. Hans. So I think I skip, uh, skip this one. Uh, when we are making all these computer methods, we really try to also measure their precision. We try to benchmark, I mean, how often do we find um, a, a word um, in, in, um, um, in the patient record that, um, uh, that actually is, is, um, is, is correct? And uh, I mean, it's hard to see here, but I mean, we can have some doctors actually reading the patient records and then we can measure how well we are doing. And our first attempt, we were close to 90% and then we fixed some of the problems with the uh, negations and, and, and we are close to 95% now in, in what we are um, doing. But, but uh, we are really picking up a lot of disease terms from the, from the vo uh, vocabularies, uh, using these controlled vocabularies. I mean, there are other types of errors like, um, I mean, a patient, this is St. Hans, so, so a patient might think that, that he or she has contracted AIDS. And of course, when we pick up the word AIDS, um, uh, then of course it should not go into the patient profile before the patient actually has developed age and, uh, AIDS and so on. Uh, but, but it's surprisingly efficient in actually producing a much more um, a detailed phenotypic uh, profile. Uh, but there are errors, I mean, uh, in, in this type of thing, but we are sort of just looking for correlations which are there, but one should be, be, be careful. One of the strong correlations that we, we, uh, we found uh, in the St. Hans data was the correlation between the two diseases, uh, plague and cholera, okay? And uh, plague is, um, of course, not that common in, in Denmark. <laughs> Uh, anymore, it's a couple of hundred years uh, since, and, and, and it turns out that, as you know, in Danish we say uh, when we have to choose between two equally awful alternatives, that we have to choose between pest and cholera, between plague and cholera, and these, these words, I mean plague, pest, and cholera, they, they are of course ICD-10 terms, so they will be picked, picked up by the system, but we found 22 patients that whenever they had plague, they would also have cholera. Uh, uh, but, uh, and that was a really strong correlation because of course, as plague is so rare, uh, this was really unexpected and we would like to pick up the unexpected. But of course, we have to go through it with the doctors and say, ah, okay, this cannot be true and so on. So, so text mining, as you know, also from Google, it's, it's, it's very efficient, but it's also making Errors, but we are sort of looking at the correlations that we find. So, um, uh, so what we get out of this is this long list of 8,000 patients and then 22,000 words out here. We get these vectors, and, and, and one thing we can use it for is to look for what is called comorbidities. I mean, when you have one disease, how often do you also have another disease? There's a little bit of math here, but I mean, you can, for example, use this expression and then the expression then you can see you would like to, to, to look at disease pairs, disease A and disease B, and you will only look at those that occur two times as much together as one would expect, okay? And, um, and um, uh, I mean, the colors are really hard to see here, I'm sorry, but I mean, here you see a lot of diseases or you should have seen a lot of diseases and you have the same diseases down here. And, and um, you can cluster it, I mean, red means that they co-occur a lot, and you see, for example, how drug abuse, liver disease, and HIV go together as a cluster, and there's not much surprise in that. But we use this type of system to spot diseases which co-occur uh, much more often than they, they, they should. And i just show you a few uh, examples here. We have two diseases. One is glaucoma, it's sort of optic nerve, damage, um, um, and uh, the other one is kyphosis, 
It is hunchback, I mean, not that common uh, either. But we found that these two diseases uh, co-occurred much more than you would um, expect. So what we do in terms of bringing this back to the DNA, to back to the genes, uh, we sort of look at one disease and we look up the sort of network of genes behind that one disease. And then we look at the network of the other disease and then we see whether they actually share genes. And they might share a gene that if this gene here that sort of plays a part in both diseases, if that is mutated, then of course it could explain that these diseases which are very different from each other, that they actually co-occur. So that is a way we use the phenotypic data from the hospitals to actually try to understand the, the, um, the genotypes and the, and the DNA. I have another one here that I can show you that is baldness and migraine. And again, found a very interesting gene that sort of seems to bridge these two, two, um, two, 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 two phenotypes. And of course, if all the patients at St. Hans had been sequenced, we could just look up and see whether there's something wrong with that gene. This is not the case yet, but in a few years' time, due to this rapid decline in how uh, much it costs to sequence uh, an individual, we can just look up and see whether that mutation or whether uh, that gene uh, has mutations that will explain the, the um, uh, disease correlations that we, that we see. We can also use this type of approach for clustering the patients. So now I, I, I told you about finding diseases which co-occur, but of course when we have this distance between all the 8,000 St. Hans patients, we can actually try to cluster them and say all those which are similar, they go together and we color them um, using one color from, from, from ICD-10. And then we can look at the entire hospital and see how the patients actually phenotypically in terms of their disease profiles relate to one another. And this is of course something like this which will be the basis for more individualized treatment because you cannot just say all, all these guys are, are the same. Actually this blue one here is close to another disease cluster where maybe this person here should be treated differently than those which are sort of in the core of this cluster and so on. So, so this business of, of clustering and also stratifying as it's called in English uh, patients uh, for example, not only across one hospital, but maybe across an entire country is something that we, we, we work on, sort of putting patients into to, to groups. Again, we should remember that drugs are made by companies and they might not get a business out of making a drug for each individual, at least not for all diseases. So we still need to work with these groups and so on. So let me finally also say that, that um, I mean patient records is one type of, of, of data, but uh, we also have registries in, in, in Denmark and, and uh, what we can use these data for is for example to align patients in time. So we say, okay, maybe you got this disease described by this ICD-10 code, but what did you get before and what did you get after? So we can sort of make make a trajectory of diseases. So again, uh, one thing is how diseases co-occur and so on. In, in those vectors I showed you before, we had forgot about time, but we can actually also take the time from the patient records and find out, uh, first you get type two diabetes, then you get um, heart problems and so on, and you can try to, to relate that again to the, to, 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 to the code. And again, Denmark is an excellent country for doing this type of, of research because we have registries that have picked up all the hospitalizations and we have worked with part of this from, from what is called the Danish patient registry, uh, Lands Patient Register, and uh, we have worked with 45 million uh, admissions in Legels from, from, from this. And just to show you very fast that, I mean, you can look at all these disease correlations. Of course, when you have 45 million admissions, you have 45 million times 45 million uh, things to look at. It's huge numbers. So how we boil it down and find something interesting is, is something that we work on. Uh, but again, we use this ICD-10 system to sort of get an idea about which diseases correlate with which other um, uh, diseases. 
and we can sort of make networks of diseases which co-occur more than they 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 uh, they should. And I just flash this, but I mean, uh, I mean, this is what we can do in Denmark. This is very difficult to to do in Spain or in Italy, where they don't have a registry. They might even have gotten their social security number very late, so they cannot relate one admission to a hospital to to um, to another. But we can do that in in in, in Denmark and find out how do, does these how, do, how how does these um, correlations relate to the to 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 the DNA? So what we have done here, and I'll just show you the graphics. I mean, we've taken a clustering of all the correlations from these 45 million admissions and see w which clusters come out uh, here. And 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 uh, I mean, it's very difficult to see here, but here you see some of the clusters of the diseases which co-occur. So this is really going beyond the single disease way of studying diseases. We, we, we look at all the correlations and, and, and it's difficult to, to see, but we can cluster the clusters and we can get an idea about how diseases co-occur sort of really grand scale when we go from, from, um, uh, from one person but uh, use sort of six million people as, um, as the statistical basis for doing, doing this and we can zoom in again on the networks and find out uh, this type of diabetes, how does it correlate um, with, with other types of diseases. So this is really an opportunity. So when we talk about hacking the DNA, I mean, we should not only think about the DNA data, but we should also think about all the phenotypic data that we find in the, in the uh, hospitals because we need it in order to understand and crack the code what is actually written in these DNA sequences. And it's interesting, we, we, I'm sure many of you know Eske Villasle, we work with him on, on, on several genomes and, and here's the Greenlander genome that was sequenced a few years ago. It's a 4,000 old year person. I mean, it, you can sequence uh, living individuals, but you can also, I mean, DNA is a very sta stable molecule, at least under certain conditions, so you can also sequence um, uh, dead people. Actually, dead people are much better uh, sequencing because you know what they died from. I mean, living people are semi-boring uh, because they, they, they are often healthy. We, we, we don't need that and we don't want that. Uh, but this guy here, he died 4,000 years ago, long before this Danish registry <laughs> was, <laughs> was established. So we know nothing about his phenotype, what, what kind of disease he had. And these are so, sort of some of the mutations we could find in his sequence. For example, he has some some uh, mutations that, that are good for cold adaptation if you live in a cold environment and so on. We also found that he had an increased risk of baldness. This was a little bit embarrassing <laughs> because we, he was actually sequenced from this hair. <laughs> and and uh, so in the paper, in Eske's paper, we suggested that he died young uh, uh, in order to sort of... Uh, but it's actually quite... Um, quite little you can you can make just of the sequence in, in itself. Of course, you can when you send to 23andMe, you can get uh, quite a bit of information uh, back. But actually, combining with all the phenotypic data that I've been been talking about, um, you can get um, you can get much more out of of of, of, of the data. So finally, um, I mean, DNA sequencing is now very cheap. I mean, we talk about the $1,000 genome and so on, and, and as I said before, the cost will essentially go away because now new sequencing techniques where you take the DNA and pu put it through nanopores, and I mean so, so that you can sort of read the, 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 the sequence very fast and so on, they are appearing on the market, so I mean it will become much cheaper than $1,000 to sequence a human genome very well uh, just in a few years' time. But, but the whole expense in this business shifts to the analysis. I mean, it might take you a man year or two man year to analyze the, the, the data. Again, here, the, the hospital sector data uh, and all the phenotypes that I've been talking about, um, they will become very uh, important because they can be used to bring that cost down if we have to analyze uh, the genome of five million people and, 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 and make all these analyses, it will be very costly if it's sort of one or two man years each. We really need the, the, the data from the hospitals in order to, to make this 
uh, in a computerized fashion where we can compute the distances and we can group patients and so on and learn 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 more. So um, my my take home message here is that when if we should hack the DNA, I mean we we um, um, we should um, use the fine-grained phenotypic data that we can get from the, the uh, hospitals, and we should also use what we call network biology. I mean, it's not one gene, it's sort of networks of genes that are behind diseases and some of the complex diseases like cancers and so on, diabetes. It's maybe thousands of genes that are involved in, 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 um, in, in the phenotype. Um, this is sort of one of the take-home messages here. I would just warn you before we we uh, we end and we get to the uh, the cocktails. I mean, the human genome is complicated. It's three three million base pairs, but uh, it's getting even worse because there's something called this is another of our papers uh, from from last year from Nature. There's something called our other genome. It turns out that we are not just having one genome, our own human genome with the 23 chromosomes that I showed you in the beginning, but also inside us, in, in our gut, for example, there's a lot of bacteria living. Millions and billions of bacteria that lives inside us. And um, maybe in an average person here, maybe you're a little bit above average, I, I don't know, but I mean, there will be 10,000 different bacteria living inside you in the gut in your sort of fecal system and, and, uh, and so on. Mon uh, murky business. And um, it's clear that, that these bacteria, they have a lot of genes. They can carry out a lot of biochemistry. And um, we have found actually by sequencing hundreds of, 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 uh, of people, sequencing the DNA of these bacteria from, from, from the fecal samples, we found over three million new genes in this type of, of, of data. So in addition to our own genome, we have this other genome. And of course, remember also that the gut is one cavity. We also have the oral cavity and so on. We have the ears. I mean, we have bacteria all over. It's a mess. And, and uh, so, so DNA sequencing will not stop with our own genome, but we will also sequence our guts. And it's a long story. And Jay is now getting impatient for the cocktail. So. So I cannot talk more about it, but this is one of the new avenues that is not just to focus on our own genome, but all the organisms that live together with us and, and sort of carry out a lot of our metabolism and, and, um, and all that.